Welcome to the universe in a seashell, the podcast dedicated to science, life, and girl power. I'm Kara Bartek, and I'm your host. I'm a PhD, an author, and I want to make this world a more equal and opportune place, one girl at a time. What's up, guys? You're listening to The Universe in a Seashell. It's Kara, and I am your host, and I am joined by one of my favorite co-hosts, Caroline. Hi, guys. Hey, we've got a very special shout-out this week. It's to Cami from Pleasantville, New York. She's nine years old, and she loves the podcast. Hey, Cami, thank you so much for listening. I hope that you're enjoying things, especially the Dino series. And if you have a special request for a dinosaur you'd like to hear on the podcast, send it my way. All right, Caroline. This episode is all about triceratops now this was a special request from claire and lucy hey claire and lucy i hope you're enjoying your holiday week we sure do miss you but we think about you a lot right yes we do um now this was a very special dinosaur for them because their grandparents live in the state that this is the state dinosaur for which is wyoming okay so since 1994 the triceratops has been the state dinosaur for wyoming so this is very appropriate and it's also it's it's a pretty cool dinosaur now what what do you notice first and foremost about the triceratops doesn't it have that big plume on its head oh yes it's got like a massive head, doesn't it? Kinda it kind of looks like a turkey's tail. <laughs> I never thought about it. Yeah, they call that a skull frill. And it's, it's, it's such a unique looking dinosaur. Now, okay, do you think that a triceratops is tough? It looks like a rhinoceros. But do you think it's like a killer... Like it's a plant eater, herbivore. It totally is. It totally. But it is. looks tough. It does look tough. A, a lot of dinosaurs look tough. I think it's just because they're. But so... a lot of them are herbivores. Yeah, they they are. So, but now of course they had to defend themselves against a lot of meat eating predators. Um, so you know all of the special skull frills and armor and all of that kind of stuff became necessary for them to have but you know i look at a dinosaur like the triceratops and i can't believe that his main food is like the veggie sub from subway right (laughs) he's eating grass he's eating uh leaves and he's not eating dinosaur face which kind of that's what i'm thinking when i look at that tough looking guy right (laughs) yeah he's tough (laughs) Now, you said it already, they are herbivorous. They're only eating vegetation. And they came up in the very late Cretaceous period. And and remember from our previous podcast on dinosaurs, there are those three main eras in the Mesozoic period of time, which is the... Cretaceous? Yeah, the Cretaceous is the very last one. There's the... Triassic, Jurassic, and then of course the Cretaceous. And the very last time period, the Cretaceous, is where we find the Triceratops. Actually, about 68 million years ago, which is actually in the long periods of time. wasn't Wasn't that long ago? Mm-mm, doesn't 68 years ago doesn't seem too long. 68 million million that's long then. yeah it's it's a long time but not compared to some dinosaurs so this lived much closer to our time period than some of those earlier dinosaurs from the triassic uh-huh. now triceratops is greek for three horned face it's because it has two horns near its plume and then one horn on its nose yes absolutely now According to my research, though, the Triceratops actually only had 
two genuine horns. The third horn, that one that you're talking about on the nose, is actually just the end of its snout, and it was just made of a soft protein called keratin, so it wasn't really a bone. So it moved? Uh, I don't know if it moved, but it's, it's, keratin is the same thing that makes up fingernails, if that makes sense. Okay. Our fingernails kind of feel a little hard. Yeah, but not nearly as hard as a bony horn, like the one that could be found. I on thought the you were talking skull. about the thing that we that our ears are made of. Oh no, that is um, that's cartilage. Yeah. And our noses, that's kind of wiggly. That's kind of like a soft bone, but keratin's a little bit different. I think keratin is also the same stuff that certain whale's teeth are made of. Or maybe I'm thinking of baleen. It's kind of, it's just a soft, flexible tissue. So, you know, the, the end of the triceratops nose would be kind of more soft and flexible, although it still looks pretty darn tough, right? It looks whitish. Our fingernails are clear. Yeah, they're kind of white on the end. I bet it depends. Yeah. But that's Mine aren't too white because I chew them. <laughs> <laughs> true dat, sister, true dat. Okay, now, so the Triceratops was actually discovered in 1887 near Denver, Colorado. A gentleman named John Bell Hatcher discovered the first ever remains of a triceratops. And what he found was a pair of horns that were attached to a skull roof, which is where the dinosaur, the three-horned dinosaur gets the name from. Okay? Triceratops. Triceratops, absolutely. Now that infamous skull actually comprised one third of the triceratops body. So think about it the way that we see it in books, on television shows, its skull is just massive. And again, it's so huge, it comprises one third of its body. So again, if you were to cut your body up into, into three, three pieces, pieces, yeah, one of those pieces would be your head if you were to be compared to the Triceratops. That's kind of crazy, right? Yeah. I think our body is our biggest part. Our bodies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they totally are. But it's, it's a little bit reverse for the poor old Triceratops. <laughs> <laughs> his body is small and his head is ginormous. Now listen to this. That backwards pointing frill, which you already talked about, could very easily attain a length of over seven feet. Yeah, so that's, so let's, let's talk about the biggest NBA basketball player. That's about how big just the skull frill would be. Hold on. Okay, you said seven feet. Seven feet. Long? Absolutely. Oh. That's, heavens. Yeah, that's huge. Now, males, their, their skulls and their skull frills could get even bigger. Ten feet? Yeah, and they said that... Actually, I was correct, ten feet? Well, I don't know about it being ten feet. All it says it could get even bigger than that which is just hard to imagine because again, their sizes are enormous and off the scale. Now, the Triceratops also had a very hard parrot-like beak. So if you think about the times that you see their skulls being photographed, um, any kind of depiction in books, it does look kind of like they have a beak, almost like a turtle, right? Yeah, like a sea turtle. Yeah, their, their mouth is, is definitely different. It's one of the lesser known facts about the Triceratops that they had these beaks and it could, it was useful for clipping off hundreds of pounds of very tough vegetation. You know, if woody stalks, vines, uh, tree limbs, all of that kind of stuff. They had to make sure that they were cutting through that because again, hey, their skull frill is already seven foot long, right? Mm -hmm. So they clearly are ha have very, very large appetites. So they had to make sure that their mouths were equipped to get enough nutrition throughout the day. And to make day. sure that their body was big enough to carry that ginormous frill. Because if they were as skinny as a pencil, they would fall over so many times. <laughs> and they didn't have fast food, right? No. 
They didn't have, they didn't have all the modern conveniences that we had. Yeah. Um, it was a tough, it was a tough journey. Now, they, ha they did have ancestors that were about the size of big house cats. Okay, so by the time that the Ceratopsian dinosaurs reached North America during the late Cretaceous period, they had evolved to the size of cattle, but their very distant progenitors were small, occasionally bipedal, they're even saying, and it kind of looks What does very... bipedal mean? Okay, bipedal means walking on two legs. Okay, so a quadruped... Oh my... Yes. So, it, it, can you imagine a dinosaur that looks like a triceratops walking on two legs? Hi, 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 hi. <laughs> With a ginormous frill. With a ginormous frill, absolutely. Um, but, you know, by the time, again, that they came to North America, they were already quadrupeds, and that means walking on four legs. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. All right. Now, the frill on, on their skull signaled to other herd members, okay? So it was conveying a message. Um, as with other anatomical structures in, in the animal kingdom, this thin flap of skin over the solid bone uh, served a dual or maybe even a triple purpose. The most probable explanation is that it was used to signal other members of the herd. A brightly colored frill flushed pink by the numerous blood vessels under its surface may have signaled that they were ready for a mate or could convey a warning of an approaching hungry T-Rex, okay? So they've got the skin over, over this huge skull frill and there are a lot of blood vessels very close to the surface. So they could control their blood flow to make sure that they were telling other members of their herd what was up, okay? Okay, so they could turn their blood different colors? It's not that they were turning their blood different colors, they were rushing blood to that skin and it would change. So for example, when you get mad or sad, you what turn happens? red. Absolutely, okay, now why are you turning red? What, what's what's happening in your body that's making you turn red? Sometimes you, you can, might clench up. Right, and but you, there's, but I'm, I'm referring to, what, oh, you're, you're and saying. And you're pumping it. blood up? Yes, you're pumping blood to your cheeks, and that's what happens. It's, it's called a physiological reaction. Or whenever you hang upside down on the monkey bars, red blood flows to your head. And Absolutely. And it turns your face red. Absolutely, you're totally that right. That happens with me. Yeah. <laughs> Do your eyes bulge out as well? <laughs> happens. And then you fall on your head? Sometimes. <laughs> It happens. What happens on the monkey bars stays on the monkey bars. <laughs> so again, so they're rushing blood to the skin that's covering this skull, this, uh, skull frill, and it could say, hey, I'm ready to find a husband or a wife, or it was saying, warning, 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 there's a T-Rex and he wants to eat your face off. Okay? <laughs> There's also that secondary function of the, the skull frill that we referred to just a few moments ago. And that may have been that this was a way for the Triceratops to regulate their body temperature. So again, dinosaurs are generally considered to be cold-blooded animals. And that means that they rely upon the sun to, to regulate their metabolism, and their, their body temperature. Are we warm-blooded? We are warm-blooded. So we've got this internal metabolism. Um, we also can shop at Target and get nice sweaters. <laughs> and turn on our heater. <laughs> but the Triceratops may have been using this very large skull frill basically as like a solar panel. <laughs> now, Triceratops duels could get nasty, okay? So this is a behavioral thing that, that I picked up on. Now, again, we talked about them being very gentle, just kind of plant-eating dinosaurs, but listen, they could get nasty with one another. And what paleontologists are finding is that there's some pretty gnarly battle scars, battle scars on these fossils, okay? 
Um, distinctive wounds are found very often near eye sockets and at the base of the frills in Triceratops skulls. And you might be asking, okay, why exactly are they there? Well, according to research that was conducted in 2009, the injuries were likely caused by adults locking their horns in combat, okay? So they might have been fighting over territory. They might have been fighting over mates. Who knows? But they definitely have found evidence that they would lock horns and fight, fight, fight. Fighting, fighting for food? It might have been fighting for food. But you can Nobody get can food really anywhere if you're a herbivore. You would think, but you know, they were towards the end of the Cretaceous period, which we're going to talk a little bit about this. They the were environment? Yeah, the environment. So they were actually alive during the major extinction event for dinosaurs, which they call the KT extinction. And again... It's important to realize that this extinction event didn't kill all the dinosaurs at once. It was a slow process. Why do they call it the KT extinction? Okay. Um, thanks for interrupting me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I that was weird. KT. Yeah, so it refers to the two periods of time. And so geologists will kind of look at the strata of rocks, which means they're looking at what does the sediment look like right in in rocks and the particular line that exists where they know that dinosaurs most likely went extinct is the called the kt boundary okay and so back now what was i talking about you completely distracted me <laughs> anyway so they were they were actually alive during this extinction event so there is a very high likelihood that they were suffering from starvation and a lot of plant die-offs. Because remember what happened when the meteor struck. A lot of ash went into the air and vegetation began to die. So, yeah, they might have been fighting for very scarce food, right? Mm -hmm. I think you're right there. Where? T-Rex could. Oh, no, um, so again, thank you for distracting me. But you know what? That's the way the cookie crumbles when you're a mom. Don't be looking at my research. Don't be looking at my research. I was more Sorry. referring to, I couldn't remember what I was talking about when you so rudely interrupt me. You know what I'm going to do one day? I'm going to go to your class, and every time you start to talk, I'm going to go, Caroline, can I have a drink of water? Hey, Caroline. Hey, Caroline. What's, what's the KT boundary? Hey, Caroline. What's that thing hanging out of your nose? That's what I'm going to do. It's called a booger. <laughs> oh. Okay. So, back to my research and my handy dandy notes. T-Rexes couldn't resist nibbling on Triceratops faces. Okay? So they had to bite a Triceratops face? Well, listen. Paleontologists discovered T-Rex bites on Triceratops faces, okay? Mm hmm So they think that the reason that T-Rexes would target the face is because it was very delicate tissue and it would be easy to basically subdue them by biting them on the face. Did the Triceratops bite T-Rexes on the face? Um, no. T-Rexes are biting the Triceratops. Okay. Triceratops um, really couldn't get as tall as our they could jump. friend the T-Rex. I don't know. Well, their ancestors could stand on their back legs, but I don't think Triceratops could do that, especially with that huge, heavy skull. I imagine that would be very difficult. <laughs> now, here's the deal with Triceratops. Because their skulls were so large, so big, so dense, their, their bones were resistant to natural erosion. So we're finding a ton of them everywhere, 
okay? Um, we covered, what was, what was the dinosaur that we covered a couple of, was it the stegosaurus? Yeah, that they had only found about two dozen stegosauruses yeah, in the world. they were very rare. Very rare. Well, stegosaurus, uh, well, with the triceratops, it's, it's very different. They're, they're actually finding a lot of their bones, being able to recover them, again, because the skull was so big in and Wyoming? so dense. Yeah, a lot of them are in Wyoming, um, generally all in North America. Now, and they're very, very expensive. In fact, one Triceratops skull sold for $1 million. Who bought it? It was donated. It was just, it was purchased by a wealthy guy, and it was actually donated to the Boston Museum of Science. This was back in 2008. That's actually pretty cool. Yeah. So um, it, it looks like it was just kind of an anonymous, wealthy donor. But again, a million dollars for a fossil? That's incredible, right? That's kind of... That's a lot of money. Expensive. Yeah. Now, because these guys are so valued, there is what's called a black market for these bones. And that means an illegal trade of Triceratops bones. Yeah. You're not supposed to sell Triceratops bones. Yeah, really, you kind of want all of the people who are like scientists, academics, museum curators, you want them handling it and preserving it. At least that it. guy bought it and then... You're interrupting me again. Donated You're it. interrupting me again. <laughs> Quit interrupting me. Quit interrupting me. Oh my goodness. Was... Hey, hey, moms out there, drop me a line if your kid is constantly interrupting you. <sighs> Mm-hmm. I was gonna say Quit interrupting me. Anyway, I don't even know what I was gonna say. You making me crazy, woman. <laughs> you making me crazy. <laughs> now again, I was speaking about the fact that Triceratops were alive during the asteroid impact during the KT ext extinction. Um but here's the deal. Paleontologists believe that by the time the extinction event came around, that dinosaur evolution had actually slowed to a crawl, um, and it resulted in a lot of loss of diversity. So because of that um, and other factors, extinction seemed to basically go very, very quickly. Now, along with other fellow plant eaters, Triceratops were absolutely doomed by the loss of vegetation. Again, the asteroid impact made a ton of sediment, dirt, ash, all of that kind of stuff go into the air and it blocked out the sun and photosynthesis stopped and plants began to die. And then plant eaters died and then meat eaters didn't have enough right. plant eaters to eat. So then they went so Triceratops then, were basically probably the first victims. So, uh, poor Triceratops. But they, you know, they're they're really cool. They they're one of the most interesting dinosaurs to look at, don't you think? Mhm. Mm Cuz of that big You know what? I think this is a very good Thanksgiving dinosaur. <laughs> because it because the skull frill looks like a turkey a turkey plume. plume yeah okay okay i dig it i dig it well guys thank you so much for tuning into the universe in a seashell remember if you're enjoying the podcast please hit the subscription or notification button depending on whatever pod app you're listening to and also leave us a rating and review and please make sure on that review that you tell caroline to quit interrupting me that would be great that'd be great Hey, happy Thanksgiving, guys. Bye.